How much peace are you experiencing these days? Would you be able to say that you're writing a chapter that's peaceful right now? Maybe you're thinking, well, Jeremy, that's not really fair to ask in this current cultural moment. But relating to the topic of peace, there's an old Christian tradition that used to be popular in Western culture where people would speak peace onto each other. It might look something like this. Someone might uh, greet another person and say, peace be with you, and they would return and with you. But here's the clincher. When they would leave each other, they would say, go in peace. Imagine that, go in peace. Uh, Imagine if today people interacting about their day But when they left each other, as they said goodbye, they said, go in peace. That the last words we spoke to each other were peace. How would that change what we're living, what we're experiencing, the story we're writing? You know, as I started looking into this old tradition of saying, go in peace, I was fascinated to find it in the Urban Dictionary. That's right, the Urban Dictionary. And the definition was pretty good, to be honest. It says, a farewell saying, to leave without harm or harming, to leave with the Spirit of God. That's pretty close to what the original intent was. I love that. To go in peace, not to be harmed, nor to harm anyone else, like a reminder, and in God's Spirit. That's beautiful. But then I started researching it more and I I found this statement, uh, this description by the great theologian Charles Spurgeon. He said it this way, go in peace. Perhaps you are going to the sick bed of one of your dearest friends. Possibly there is one at home who is so depressed in spirit as to depress you too. Never mind, go in peace. It will strengthen you to have your heart at peace. Spurgeon seems to indicate that going in peace is a choice, that we can decide to go in peace. What would that look like? What would that look like if today you decided, I decided, that we made a conscious decision that we would go in peace, no matter who we were interacting with, no matter what was happening, that we thought through, allowing our thoughts to speak over our emotions, to take control and decide to go in peace. Now, to go in peace, to be a peaceful person, there's risk, because not everyone likes a peaceful person. And, and it takes faith to be a peaceful person. You have to have faith that maybe someone's gonna reciprocate it and be peaceful to you. But more importantly, to be a person of peace, to go in peace, the risk, the faith, is trusting that God will take care of it all. Trusting that God's in control. Only when God's in control and we believe it, can we go in peace. So now as we start this journey, As we start to write this chapter, I'll say to you, go in peace. Words fill a page. Pages fill a chapter. Chapters fill a book. Every decision, big and small, writes the story of your life. Unfortunately, some people leave portions of their story unwritten. Sometimes that's why you need to go ahead and take the risk. My story, I decided to go. We've been going through a series titled My Story, Living the Story You Want to Tell. And as we've been going through this series, we've been looking at an ancient letter written by a follower of Jesus, missionary church planter, the Apostle Paul. He wrote it to the Church of Philippi, the Philippian Christians, Philippian followers of Jesus. And they had a tough life. There was lots of struggles, just like we're going through struggles. They were real people. Uh, They were having struggles with authorities and struggles with each other. And Paul writes this letter to them under the Holy Spirit's leading to give them some insight on a better way to live. And so we've been digging into it because we want to live better. We want to live a better life, tell a better story. And in the first week, we talked about a decision to start a life of legacy, that the way we live in this moment can be focused on eternity. We can place Jesus at the center and then start living a bigger story, writing better chapters. 
Then we moved on to week two and we made a decision to stop living for self. Once Jesus is at the center, then we can start impacting others. Then last week, we looked at a decision to stay the course. When things get difficult, when things want to railroad us, when we face struggles, we can sometimes want to quit and walk away. But last week, we talked about staying the course, continuing to move forward. And you've been studying this. You've been talking about it. Thank you so much for being with us in this series. If you're just checking it out now, I would suggest stopping because we're in the fourth week and go to mountainviewwhitehorse.ca slash watch. And you can pick up on previous episodes and then jump back and then you won't miss anything. But what about this week? This week is our final week. And we're going to look at chapter four of Philippians, the final chapter. And this is Paul's send off to the Philippian church, to people who follow Jesus and the city of Philippi. He's, he's sending them off. This is his final message to them and kind of the, the last thing he wants to leave them with. And there's a word that comes up a few times, peace. He's going to tell them to kind of go forward, to keep moving forward in peace. Last week, we were staying the course, pushing through. Now he's sending them out on their own. And he's given them some last bit of advice. And we're going to look at it. We're going to dig into this concept of going in peace, making a decision to go in peace. All right, let's start. If you have a print Bible, you can open it to Philippians chapter four. If you're unfamiliar with looking things up, there is a table of contents in the beginning of every Bible. And just find Philippians and go to the page number. If you have a mobile device, you have a tablet, phone, download a Bible app, and then search Philippians four and you'll get there. We're going to look at a few passages at a time, kind of talk about it in between each one as we read it. And uh, we're going to start in Philippians four, verse four, Philippians four, verse four. All right, here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Let's pause right there. Rejoice always and be reasonable. Uh, Let your reasonableness, when's the last time you heard that word, be known to everyone. This is pretty absolute, isn't it? And actually, if you look at this word reasonableness, you might in your uh, version of the Bible and and some translations, it, it says gentleness. This idea of a calm and, uh, Uh, calculated or a timely or gentle way of responding to people. Not always easy. And, And it's interesting that there's an assumption here by Paul that somehow we're supposed to choose joy or choose to be joyful in all circumstances. Always? Really? Can we do that? And this whole thing about reasonableness, can we really be calm and gentle and speak in reason with people all the time? It's interesting when I go to study scripture, you know, before I preach a message, there's often things in my life that God allows in that's going to test whether or not I can practice what I preach. I had a situation this past couple weeks with my snowmobile. If you live in the North, you know, snowmobile problems and, and I'm not a mechanical guy, full disclosure. Um, It's just not my forte. And for whatever reason, I needed a cold weather sensor in my snowmobile. And so I took my snowmobile to uh, the the repair shop and I said, hey, it's cold weather sensor and they trade this out and then it's working. Should be no problem. Maybe a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks, can't be much. Well, then they come back and they say, oh, well, we got this. This is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. All these other problems that were supposed to be taken care of that weren't. I'm just, what do I know? I ask a bit of advice and I go for it. Okay. They're machines. They break. There's some things that need repaired. Let's just do it so we can be out on the trail. So I do it. And I sink uh, more money than I anticipated into this snowmobile. And then uh, my family is out for a snowmobile ride. Um, I've got me on the front, Nicole's on the back, my wife, and then my kids are in, uh, in skimmer sleds trailing behind him. And we're having a great time. We're not going fast. We're just heading on the trail, enjoying the sun, enjoying the snow. It was great. We made it three kilometers, about a couple miles for American viewers. And all of a sudden the track just locked up and there we are. And that's that. It just stops. It locks up. And so we had to walk back and thankfully someone uh, was able to help us. Thank you again to that person who's listening. And we walked back and we managed to get my snowmobile back to the shop. 
And as I start explaining the situation and what happened, the snowmobile mechanic kind of makes it sound or he's starting to talk like it's my fault. And maybe he's a little embarrassed that he just let me have this snowmobile and now it's back in the shop a day later. I don't know what he was going through. But in that moment, I did not want to be reasonable. I did not want to be gentle. I definitely wasn't rejoicing. It's interesting, though, that in that moment, I have a decision. I, what I want to do emotionally is I want to lash out. I want to let him have it. You were supposed to check this, and right after, it breaks again. I just brought this in for a cold weather sensor, and all of a sudden, there's all this other stuff. It worked fine before this little sensor was supposedly failed and all this other things. I wanted to justify myself. I wanted to be angry. I wanted to be bitter. I wanted to lay into him. And... <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. That's what my everything was calling me to do. But then I'm thinking about from all this study I'm doing, I'm like, how do I rejoice always? How do I, how do I get possibly reasonable and gentle? How do I do this? And I was able to square up with him and just say, I'm just, I just was able to say, I'm trying to be gracious. I'm trying to be kind to your man, but I am, I'm just flabbergasted that this happened to me. And I, I, I just needed to be fixed and, and I don't got much money left, <laughs> you know? And when he saw that I responded that way, he responded back. And this is a starting point for us. And that all of us, we assume that we need to fight. And a lot of times if we respond in a different way, people can reciprocate that. And it doesn't always go as we thought it would. Now, I wish I could say that it didn't cost me a little bit more money and it didn't. And it doesn't always work like that. But I got my snow wheel back and it is working. And uh, that's part of life. Machines break, trucks break, cars break, snowmobiles break, four wheelers break. That's part of life. But how we respond when things go wrong, can we rejoice? Can we find something to be happy about? Can we be something? Can we be reasonable with people? Can we be gentle with people? Now, let's keep moving on. At the end of verse five, it says this statement, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And then in verse uh, six and seven, it says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, I need to uh, pause here because a lot of times when we look at the Bible, there's all these verse numbers that separates everything. And this actually Philippians four, seven, uh, six and seven is actually a really popular verse in Christian culture. You know, if we just read it starting in six, it says, do not be anxious about anything. And then so on. It actually starts. The verse starts with a do not, but that's not actually the start of the thought. And, and if sometimes if we remove the verse numbers, we get a bigger picture of what's going on. And, and it actually, this statement starts with the, the second half of verse five. It says, the Lord is at hand, semicolon, do not be anxious about anything. The Lord Jesus. Remember the first week we were focused in on Jesus. Jesus has to be the, be the center that we can't go on in life, writing new chapters without Jesus being central. He's the activator, the motivator, the sustainer. And here he is again. The Lord is near. The Lord Jesus is near or the Lord Jesus is at hand. Different translations say nearer at hand. And so what, is, what does this mean? What does this look like? Well, it links things because now it's different. Instead of just a statement of do not be anxious. Now it's Jesus is with you. Jesus is at hand. Jesus is near. Therefore, do not be anxious. And so on, you know, there's uh, scholars debate on what this, the Lord is at hand, what Paul really meant at that. And there's two things they debate on. One is that the Lord is physically near, meaning an awareness of Jesus presence that focusing in on Jesus Christ, being in, in his spirit and, and in worship to him, communion with him, we can feel him at times th that we feel him physically near. But then there's also this concept of the Lord maybe or is temporally near, meaning that Jesus will be returning soon. Jesus promised when he ascended to heaven that he would return again in bodily form to, to bring those that believe in him back with him to heaven. And, and so there's debating on this. What did, what did Paul really mean? Well, 
does it matter? <laughs> Maybe it's a both and. I don't know. People way smarter than me have been arguing about this, but it doesn't change that you can't just start at verse six. That verses six and seven are only meaningful at the, because of the starting at the end of verse five, that the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Jesus is close. Jesus is central. And then therefore, anxiety can be, can be minimized, mitigated. Everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving can be given to God. We can make requests to God. We have access to God through Jesus. That's how it works. Now let's talk about this, this prayer that he talks about that he says prayer with supplication or supplication with thanksgiving. Supplication is actually a fancy theological word that, that means asking for things. When we ask God for something. Now, asking God for stuff is totally normal, even in our culture. I'm amazed at how many people who would seemingly be atheist agnostic, and yet you find them when they're in trouble, they'll throw up prayers. To, you know, it's like, I don't believe in you, God, or I, 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 wanna, I don't want to acknowledge you fully. But then all of a sudden I'm in trouble and oh, I'll throw a prayer up. I don't know if that's abnormal, but, but what is different what the Christian, what followers of Jesus are called to is supplication with thanksgiving. That asking for something should be um, coincided, should be together with giving thanks. Thank you, God, for this moment. And can you acknowledge this? Thank you, God, for this trial. It's tough, but I thank you for it because I'm going to grow. And as I walk through it, can you fill in the blank? Supplication with thanksgiving and I want to bring up here this piece at the end. It says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's interesting. The peace of God that we can't even understand. We can't comprehend that. That's the peace that comes from Jesus, from knowing Jesus, from him being in the center. The Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. That's the starter. That's the front. And then in the end of this little paragraph here, it says in Christ Jesus, that our hearts and minds are, are guarded in Christ Jesus. The Lord is at hand. Lord Jesus is at hand. And then we're guarded our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We have to see this. We, we can't just skim over this, that, that all the prophets, the old Testament were pointing to Jesus. All the, all the followers of Jesus, the apostles, the disciples, they're all pointing back to Jesus. And, and this is it over and over and over again. We, we try to do things. We want to be peaceful. We want to, we want to try to pray lots. We want to try and do things for God. And, and, and we consistently get tricked into thinking that it's all out of our own power. If I just do more, if I just do this, if I just say this, it starts with Jesus ends with Jesus, the prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, the peace the guarding of our hearts and minds, the, the peace that surpasses all understanding to truly go in peace. We must start with Jesus and end with Jesus. That's the gospel. Let's keep reading verses eight and nine. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Thoughts and practices. He, he gives a whole pile of amazing things, positive things, things that'll build other people up, build us up things, ways that we can worship God with a, a, a great way to live a great story to be written these things. And, and he says, think of these things. And then he says, look, we, I, I've, I've shown you things. I've, I've displayed a life of discipleship to Jesus. I've taught you practice these things. Think about these good things, practice these good things. And that's so important for us to understand. You see, we live in a culture. We live a culture that is run by feelings. I don't feel like doing this or I feel like doing this. And therefore I will. We, we live in a culture of reactions instead of actions. And this call, 
this call, once we place Jesus first and that peace that surpasses uh, the peace of Jesus surpasses all understanding and, and we, we make Jesus center. Then as we start living out, no, 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 no. I'm going to think differently. I'm going to act differently. I'm going to practice new behaviors, new habits. And this may be, this may mean, you know, not looking and reading at things that you normally do because let's face it in our culture right now, it's just negative, 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 negative. How can you read through these things and look through these things? Another news article of just chaos or anger, another blog post, another comment stream. Do we really think this is honorable, <laughs> joyful, praiseworthy? Uh, it, it, how can we possibly think in this way when we're constantly saturating ourselves with such negativity? That's the practice. We have to practice reading great things, thinking great things, doing great things, saying great things, that these praiseworthy, joyful, honorable things, it all flows out of relationship with Jesus. This is the call. And, and he says, and the, the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that amazing? Because it, it was like, the peace of God, it talked about above and God of peace, the peace of God in Jesus in uh, verse seven and the God of peace will be with you in, in verse nine. If we want God's peace, it starts with following Jesus, making him central and our, our life's better. Yes. The, the, the glory is coming in heaven, our eternal life. It, it will, we can't even comprehend how great it'll be. But right now in this moment, we can also have a great life. Things can be better for us. We can be writing better chapters. And so the question for all of us, this is where Paul kind of leaves us with all this stuff. This, he, he's saying, I'm, I'm sending you out Philippians. Uh, you know, I'm sending you out church. If you follow Jesus, I, I'm letting you go. It's time for you to go do this on your own. Uh, I've taught you some things and, and here's what you need to do. You need to go in peace. And so the question for us is we have to ask, will I decide? Will I not allow my feelings and reactions uh, overwhelm me? Will I make a choice? Will I choose to think differently? Will I choose to act differently? Will I make a peaceful choice? Will I write a peaceful chapter? Will I decide to go in peace when I interact with people, family, friends, co-workers, neighbors that, that maybe are negative and, and they're experiencing difficult things and it's understandable. And you listen and you feel like it's weighing you down. But, but like Charles Spurgeon said, maybe there is lots of stuff, but never mind. You can still choose to go in peace. You can still make that choice, cling to Jesus and go to go in peace. Do you need that? Do you want that? Maybe for you, this is the first time you've heard this whole thing. First time you've read this and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never experienced that peace that surpasses all understanding. If you know a Christian, if you know someone who follows Jesus, they'll explain it to you as best they can, but it's hard to explain. It's hard to understand. When the chaos of the world comes, if, if you have a close relationship with Jesus Christ, it's strange, but it's just a little easier. There's something calming. There's something gentle about his spirit, that Holy spirit that he gives us when we give our lives to him. And so for you, whether you'd like to give your life to Jesus for the first time today, or maybe you're struggling and you just need peace and you want to pray for peace right now, we're going to do that. Let's pray together. Dear Father, I thank you again for the Apostle Paul writing this great letter to your church. I thank you that we can read it and see application for our own lives. And though it was written 2,000 years ago, it could have been written yesterday. It just feels right in this moment. We feel bombarded with things that do not bring us peace. It's chaos, anger, bitterness, and it's weighing us down. And so, Father, we ask, bring us the peace of Jesus that surpasses all understanding. For those that are listening right now that are watching and they don't know you, may they submit their lives to you. May they call on you, Jesus, and may you send your Holy Spirit. May they ask forgiveness for their sin. May they repent of the wrong they've done. And may they start a new life in you. 
for those of us who claim to follow you, continue to convict us. And even though we don't feel like being gentle, we don't feel like rejoicing, we don't feel like being uh, reasonable, we don't feel like being um, honorable, we don't feel like being peaceful, convict us, Holy Spirit. Call us to something greater. May we be aware, may we be cognizant of how we act and, and, and how we impact this world. Help us be peacemakers that when we go out in, in society, on the streets and in neighborhoods to work, to friends, that, that people would want to be peaceful, that they would want to reconcile, that would, they'd want unity and community, that, that your power in us, Jesus, would, would be a light, would be that peace that goes out. Give it to us, Father. Convict us of what we need to be doing to share your light, to share your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now it's time for reflection and discussion. We got two questions again this week. Okay, question number one, here we go. During this chapter of life, right now, your life, what thoughts or practices are preventing you from experiencing peace? or from experiencing uh, going through a life of peace. What thoughts or practices are preventing you from a life of peace, a chapter of peace to write it? What's going on in your life? Talk about it. Number two, read Philippians chapter four. Find three principles or verses that will help you go in God's peace through Jesus this week. Read through the fourth chapter of Philippians. We only hit a few verses. It's important that you're studying your Bible and reading it through the week uh, or talking about it with friends, spouse, family. Uh, so read through chapter four and, and hash it out together. Find three principles together or verses that can help you go in God's peace this week through Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us this week. Uh, thank you for continuing to support Mountain View Church. And please drop us a comment, a question. If you have anything, connect with me, connect with our staff. We'd love to get to know you more. If you enjoyed this message, please share it on your social media feed or email it to a friend. 